What's up, Solo Cups? My name is John Solo, and I am finally back from vacation to shed some more light on the stories that molded your childhood. Anyone who's been in the Solo fam for a while should remember my partnership with Crypt TV from a few months back, where I analyzed some episodes from their Fable series and compared them to the famous stories they were based on. Sidebar, if you haven't checked out the miniseries I did with them yet, I gotta recommend you do, especially if you're a fan of scary movies and excessive amounts of violence. One of my favorite Fables we discussed in that series and one of your guys' too, judging by the feedback he gave me, was the Pied Piper of Hamelin. But in that episode, we didn't get to break down the legend as much as we normally get to, and I had to leave a lot of information out, so I thought it would be fun to revisit. But John, you titled this video Disney Explained. Disney never made a movie about the Pied Piper. Oh, but they did. From 1929 to 1939, Walt Disney Productions created a series of animated shorts based on old nursery rhymes and fairy tales, like The Three Little Pigs, Tortoise and the Hare, and The Ugly Duckling. This series was called Silly Symphony, and production was ceased just a year after Disney released their first animated full-length feature film, Snow White. Chances are you've seen a few Silly Symphonies yourself, maybe without even realizing it. I remember watching The Three Little Pigs on VHS a hundred times when I was a kid without once realizing it was part of a collection. As it turns out, The Pied Piper was also part of this collection, so like always, I'm gonna give you guys a quick summary of what goes down in the Disney version, and then we're gonna get into all the changes they made and some crazy details from the original legend. If you're a member of the Solo fam or just like the series and want to keep the episodes coming, make sure to smash that like button with all your heart so we can reach our goal of 5,000 likes and subscribe with notifications on so you never miss another messed up origin. Disney's Pied Piper follows the basic events of the original story. We zoom into the city of Hamelin where the rat problem has gotten out of control. These nasty creatures are harassing residents, looting valuable merchandise from shops, and causing all kinds of chaos in the streets. Hamelin citizens have had enough and gather in town square to complain about the infestation and get the mayor to finally do something. But I guess he's not the sharpest crayon in the box because all he can do is offer a bag of gold to anyone else who can fix the problem. Here's where the Pied Piper comes in. He accepts the mayor's offer, starts playing his pipe, and like magic, all the rats in the town seem to become entranced. The Piper lures them far out of Hamelin right into a giant block of cheese, a rat's greatest weakness. When all the rodents start chowing down, the Piper uses his magic to make the cheese disappear and returns back to Hamelin for his payment. Only now the mayor and residents have decided that simply playing the flute doesn't earn you the payment you were promised and lock the piper outside the gates, which understandably makes him furious. He tells the townsfolk they're dishonest, ungrateful, and he'll save the children from growing up into the same monsters as their parents. He starts playing his flute once again, and this time it's the kids who are entranced by the music. They conjugate, tear down Hamelin's gates, and follow the Pied Piper away away from the homes they once knew to a land of candy that any kid would consider heaven on earth, and they lived happily ever after. The unfortunate epilogue to that story is all the kids the Piper saved grew up to be really kind-hearted adults with terrible teeth and type 2 diabetes. They lived in Candyland, yo, I don't know what else you would expect. So obviously, that was a pretty light-hearted adaptation of the Pied Piper legend, which is in no way a light-hearted tale. I know that goes without saying, especially in this series, but what makes this story different from the other we've talked about is it might have actually happened. Hard to believe, I know, and if you're hesitant to trust me, that's fine. I think you should be skeptical when someone tells you a man used a magic flu to hypnotize and kidnap 130 kids at once. If that sentence doesn't raise any red flags for you, let me know because I've got an exciting investment opportunity. So according to town records, the incident with the Pied Piper happened around the year 1284 in the German town of Hamelin. As we all know, Hamelin was suffering from a major rat infestation that was causing all sorts of problems for the town residents, because that's all rats do. Food was getting contaminated, people were getting attacked, and disease was spreading like crazy. This was all going down less than 80 years before the Black Plague. The infamous pandemic that killed around half of Europe's population and was in part spread by rats hitchhiking along trails. Routes. So you know tensions were running high in Hamelin as neither the medicine nor the extermination methods of the time could fend off their attackers. The Pied Piper heard about the rat situation and told Hamelin's mayor that he could get rid of all of them in exchange for payment. And the mayor said, go for it, because he was at his wit's end with it. By the way, for those who don't know, the Pied Piper actually has two aliases. The first one is obviously Pied Piper. The word Pied means multicolored and references the Piper's colorful outfits, which are described differently depending on the story. The other alias is Das Rattenfänger, which is German for the rat catcher. 
that one's pretty self-explanatory. The amount of money the piper was supposed to make off this deal also varies from version to version. Some say a thousand gold coins, some say 10,000. Some would say it doesn't matter because the piper wasn't paid anyway. I guess that's where the saying pay the piper comes from. How did I not realize that last time? Actually though, the dude plays his pipe to hypnotize the rats, they all follow him into a nearby river except for one who happened to be deaf, and they drown. But when the piper got back to Hamelin, they refused to pay him the full amount and used all sorts of excuses to explain why. Like in the short film, some said all he did was play the flute so he doesn't deserve to get paid, and others even accused him of bringing the rats himself as an extortion attempt. Understandably so, this pissed the piper off, so he swore to them that he would someday get his revenge and then stormed out of town. It was on St. John and Paul's day that he returned, early in the morning too, so the adults were all in church while the children were left at home. The piper showed up wearing a green hunter's outfit and a red hat. Once again he began to play his pipe, but instead of attracting rats, this time he attracted a swarm of bees, which proceeded to sting him until he died. I'm just kidding. I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. This time, the flute's magic music hypnotized 130 of Hamelin's children, who all followed the piper into a cave in the mountains where they were never seen or heard from again. Depending on which version you read, two to four kids survived this event. In the most common version, the first kid had a busted leg and couldn't keep up, which was referenced in the Disney short. The second was deaf, so he couldn't hear the music, and the third was blind, so he couldn't see where he was going. In the Grimm Brothers story, there was four children who survived. The first was being held in the arms of a babysitter who followed the kids to figure out what was going on and then reported it to the adults. The next two kids were blind and deaf mute, so the blind kid was able to explain how the children got hypnotized and the deaf mute kid could point out where they went. The fourth kid actually didn't do anything to help. When everyone was entranced, he just ran home to get a coat because he was cold, and when he came back, they were all gone. The one detail that stays consistent across all versions of this legend is the number of victims, 130. And that's because that number's retrieved straight from the original town records. Because don't forget, this event really happened in some way, shape, or form, and it truly had an impact on the town. For example, Hamelin's town records didn't even exist until this event took place. I'm not sure if it was the mystery behind the situation that triggered it or how many citizens were affected, but apparently when 130 kids go missing at once, people People get their shit together and start taking notes. Oddly though, they didn't start the year the disappearance happened, but instead a hundred years later. The first written record of the event is dated 1384 and states, it's been 100 years since our children left. There's also several mentions in other writings of a stained glass window the church installed around that time that depicts the children following the piper. The town hall at the time was also inscribed with a few lines referencing the event. In the year 1284, after the birth of Christ, from Hamelin were led away 130 children born at this place, led away by a piper into a mountain. This is all pretty interesting stuff, but I'm sure at this point some of you are rolling your eyes. John, you keep saying the event really happened, but you also keep mentioning a magic flute that hypnotized kids, so I'm having a hard time believing you. Hey, that's understandable, and you're not the only person who's been skeptical of this story. Several historians have posed their own theories about what really happened the day those kids disappeared and where they all ended up going. There's some who believe there was no Piper at all, but instead the kids were led away by some pagan or heretic type character character, someone who was following a different religion than everyone else in town. And then they were killed by accident, like they drowned in a river they were supposed to cross or got caught in a landslide in the mountains. Others actually attribute it to the children emigrating to another region, like the nearby Transylvania. The reasons for emigrating are still up for debate, but some researchers blame it on primogeniture. This was the practice of families leaving all business and property rights to the oldest son in the family, leaving the rest of the siblings to be his farmhands and servants. It sounds like a crazy law, and that's because it kind of is, but it was put into place to prevent larger families from spreading out their assets among several children and slowly monopolizing and overpopulating the area. Supposedly, some of the kids weren't down for such a lackluster destiny laid out before them, so when their parents were in church one morning, they all took to the mountains in search of a new way of life and eventually found one. The other reason for their emigration is quite a bit darker. It's possible they were sold to a recruiter from the Baltic region to help settle new territories. Again, 
and this was related to overpopulation. Apparently, the practice of selling off illegitimate kids and orphans the town couldn't support was somewhat common in those days. Further evidence that supports this idea can be found in the town records of Transylvania and the nearby areas, which lists some of the town founders as having names that were commonly found in Hamelin. Finally, I want to give you one last possible explanation, and it's one that used to be found on the city of Hamelin's official website. Among the various interpretations, reference to the colonization of East Europe starting from Low Germany is the most plausible one. The children of Hamelin would have been in those days citizens willing to emigrate, being recruited by landowners to settle in Moravia, East Prussia, Pomerania, or in the Teutonic land. It's assumed that in past times, all people of a town were referred to as children of the town or town children, as is frequently done today. So those 130 hypnotized kids might have actually been adults who were simply looking for a better way of life, whether it be for socioeconomic or religious reasons, we don't know. What we can be sure of is the governing bodies at the time, the church and the royal families, would not have been happy with their residents just up and leaving and taking their patronage elsewhere. So to avoid their wrath, the remaining citizens fabricated the story of the Pied Piper and details were added as time went on. Due to the many translations and evolution of language over the past 700 plus years, it's possible that certain elements were just misinterpreted and then repeated until the only people who remembered what actually happened were dead. Like that game of telephone you played as a kid, only in this situation, the stakes were much higher. When it comes down to it, nobody on this entire planet knows exactly what happened on the day those kids disappear. And as long as this video is, I've still only barely scratched the surface of possible theories and explanations. I would love to dive even deeper into it, but that would probably take a few hours. My only hope is that you learned yourself something new today and you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. That may have sounded a little cheesier than I intended, but I love cheese, so back off. As always, thank you all so much for watching and continuing to show the channel your support. Thanks to your liking, sharing, and subscribing, the Solo Fam has grown to over 310,000 subscribers, and it blows my mind every single day. That being said, I think we're just getting started, so if you guys continue to show up for these videos, I will too. In that same vein, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Help us reach our goal of 5,000 likes to keep the episodes coming every week, and subscribe with notifications on so you never miss one. Per usual, the best way to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news and what projects I'm working on next is to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Once this move to Florida is out of the way, we're going to start the fan-made contest series back up, and that's largely run through social media. So if you want to participate in that, you know what to do. Until next time, Solo fam, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.